Um, great, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's um, a real pleasure to be involved in, um, I, think, I think you said there was a, a, a skeptical conference about 10 years ago, um, but this seems to be the first big event since then, so it's great to see um, a skeptical community getting together like this. Um, what I'm gonna talk about um, is uh, a book I wrote uh, a couple of years ago uh, called Trickle Treatment. Uh, it's published in English. It's been translated into Swedish, but we don't have a publisher in Norway yet. Um, so hopefully, sooner or later, somebody will translate it into Norwegian. Um, but what I'm also going to talk about, uh, the, the subtitle of the book was Alternative Medicine, Trick, uh, uh, Alternative Medicine on Trial. Trick or Treatment, Alternative Medicine on Trial. Um, so the book was all about... You know, there's this weird, wonderful thing, uh, just weird, <laughs> a thing called alternative medicine. And we hear all these crazy claims, exaggerated claims, maybe some of these claims are true. How do we work out what works and what doesn't work? And so the way we do that is through clinical trials, and hence the subtitle is alternative medicine on trial. Um, but after writing the book, I got into a legal dispute. So, so the subtitle now is um, alternative medicine and me on trial. Um, but I'll come to that later on, um, and I'll come to alternative medicine later on. First of all, I just thought I'd, I'd give you a bit of background. You've heard a bit about me, and um, my background's really in physics. And the books I've written in the past, uh, which have been translated in, into Norwegian, have been about cosmology and about mathematics and about cryptography. And um, so I thought I'd just start off with something from the world of cryptography, which, which sort of touches on skepticism as well. Um, so in cryptography, we have codes and coded messages and hidden messages. Um, and, and one of the most famous stories of hidden messages is something called the Bible Code. Um, ha hands up if you've, if you've heard of the Bible Code. Okay, most people here seem to have heard of the Bible Code. I'll race you this very, very quickly because um, some of you may know the story already. Um, but the idea of the Bible Code is that there are messages hidden in the Bible. And the way they're hidden is you take the text, you, you actually do it with the most ancient Hebrew texts, but I'll show it to you with English because it's just easier to explain. But you take the text, you get rid of the punctuation, you get rid of the spaces, and you have a string of letters. And you start somewhere. I'm going to start with the first letter, and I'm going to jump five. That's not a word. So I'm going to start somewhere else. That may be, oops, that may be the 30th letter, and I'm going to jump 28. That's not a word. I read it backwards. It's not a word. But I keep on doing this. And the incredible thing is, if you do it Eventually, you start finding words, not just words, but messages. Uh, a chap called Michael Josnin wrote a whole book about this called The Bible Code. And this is the sort of thing he found. Um, these are the ancient Hebrew texts, and you see Hitler, evil man, slaughter, Nazi enemy. But, but I mean, this is real. You can't deny that this exists. Uh, assassination of Kennedy, uh, to die, Kennedy in Dallas. And who killed him? Well, we have that as well. The marksman, or the name of the assassin, is Oswald. Uh, if physics as well, physics is in here, uh, we find Newton crossing with gravity. Um, and there are over 200 predictions in the Bible, and every single one has come true. I, this, is, this is extraordinary. Um, this is a chap called Brendan Mackay, an Australian mathematician, who said, you know, look, you know, maybe this is just a coincidence. Um, Drosnin said, look, this isn't a coincidence. If I find one word, that's a coincidence. If I find one prediction, that's a coincidence. If I find 200, that's the hand of God. Um, and he challenged Brendan Mackay. He said, if you think this is just coincidence, take another book and find predictions in another book. And in fact, he challenged him to find predictions in Moby Dick, which is you know, a large book. Of, you know, what, can, if this is a coincidence, you should be able to find predictions in other books. So Mackay started looking, and this is what he found. Uh, you do the same thing, you get rid of the spaces, you get rid of the punctuation, you have a string of text, and uh, what you find is the following. The name Trotsky. And how was Trotsky killed? He was killed with an ice pick. And an ice pick is like a hammer or the steel head of a lance. A clear prediction about the death of Trotsky in Moby Dick. And it turns out there are over 200 predictions in Moby Dick. This really is nothing more than a coincidence. Um, a book is such a large object. 
maybe a million letters. That's a million starting places, a million different ways you can jump around. That's thousands of billions of permutations. And with so many possibilities, you will find everything. Everything that will happen, everything that won't happen, everything that has happened, everything that hasn't happened. It's purely a mathematical phenomenon. Um, there are lots of wonderful uh, coincidences around us. Um, this is my favorite coincidence. If you take this very famous line from Shakespeare, to be or not to be, uh, from Hamlet, if you rearrange these letters, you get uh, the wonderful anagram. In one of the bard's best thought of tragedies, our assistant hero Hamlet queries on two fronts about how life turns rotten. Um, a perfect summary of the whole play. So either, either you say, uh, you know, how weird that Shakespeare was not just a great writer, but a great puzzler. How weird is that? Well, it's not weird at all. He just wrote so much stuff that eventually this is bound to happen. There is nothing weird about this, except that somebody found this anagram. That's the only weird thing. Um, so, um, so, but see, the thing is, and I think this is, this is uh, I think a lot of the topics you'll talk about today um, and, and tomorrow are about things that actually, when you look at them to start with, they look very convincing. Um, you know, it's not surprising that most people think that the Bible code is real because these predictions really exist. You have to do quite a bit of digging and quite a bit of reading um, or, you know, or, or read the kind of stuff that we read in order to understand that this is just a coincidence. If you don't read the extra material, the superficial presentation is very, very convincing. Um, and then, you know, there's a Bible Code 2, and Bible Code 2 has all the events of 9-11, uh, obviously pre not predicted, because the, the, the predictions are only made after the events have happened. But again, to the public, this looks really impressive. Um, and so, I think what's great in the last 10 years, and it's obviously happening here in Norway as well, is that we're beginning to, uh, I, th I think for 10 years, the... The Bible coders, the homeopaths, the psychics uh, have had it all to themselves. They've had their TV shows, they've had their newspaper columns, they've had their books, and we've kind of just sat back and, and, and let these things happen. But what's great today, and, and it's happening in other places, um, some people here will be going to TAM Australia in, 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 at the end of the month, that, that we're now sort of combating these, 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 these stories. Uh, by, by explaining the background, by providing more, more evidence. And Brendan Mackay continues to do this as well. Um, his, he thinks the best way to debunk the Bible code is to find more messages in Moby Dick. Um, and this is the best message, I think, from Moby Dick. It's a very large piece of text. Um, I hope you can see it. It contains lots and lots of references to somebody whose life was foolishly wasted in an accent involving power and velocity and whose life was mortal in these jaws of death. And the person we're talking about is the Princess of Wales, Lady Diana. Um, and in here, there are many coded messages to Lady Diana, the Princess of Wales. Um, so uh, there are so many, I'll show them to you one at a time. Um, first of all, you have Wales, because she was Princess of Wales. Then you have Diana, then her fuller name, Lady Diana. Um, how did she die? Well, it was a skid on a road. Uh, the name of the driver was Henri Paul, and the other person in the car was Dodi, 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 Dodi. <laughs> and again, this is Moby. So I get you know ridicule is one way to you know debunk these ideas. Um, so this is kind of what I've been doing for 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 a while. It's not it's writing about codes, writing about maths, writing about physics, writing about cosmology. So how did I end up writing about alternative medicine? Um, how did I end up being sued for libel? Well, um, it started off with um, acupuncture. Um, this is a very recent photo. I, 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 this is the only time I've ever been to an acupuncturist. We needed a photo for, for a magazine, and so I went to an acupuncturist, and um, we had this photo taken. But five years ago, I was only mildly interested in acupuncture. Uh, if you don't know much about acupuncture, the, the key things to know is it's an ancient Chinese system based on qi. So qi flows through the body in meridians. If the qi is blocked, then you get sick. If you insert needles or apply pressure or apply electricity, you can 
unblock the meridians and the chi flows more evenly and you become healed. That's the basic philosophy. Um, it came to Europe in 1972 when President Nixon went to China and one of his um, uh, press team uh, suffered an appendicitis and had an operation and uh, the operation was fine, but afterwards, the, 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 the journalist, a chap called James Reston, suffered from severe post-operative pain. And he was lying in bed in agony, and somebody came in with needles, put needles into his leg, and the pain in his stomach got better. And he couldn't believe it. He'd never seen acupuncture, he'd never heard of acupuncture, and he went back to um, America and wrote a huge article about acupuncture and that's what kick-started acupuncture in the West um, is the Gibson is it the Gibson girls Do I, is it the TV show called the Gibson girls no it's about a mum and a daughter in small-town America nobody at all Gilmore girls is that it is that big in Norway no <laughs> What's the daughter called? <laughs> Lauren. She gets a scholarship to study journalism, doesn't she? Um, she? It's called the James Reston Scholarship. It's a real scholarship named after a real journalist. And it's the same James Reston who popularized, in a way, kick-started the interests of, of acupuncture in the West. So I was mildly interested in acupuncture, homeopathy, lots of different things, fr from a kind of skeptical point of view. It just looked too good to be true. And then one day, there was a TV show, and I showed this clip yesterday at the university, so uh, if you were there yesterday, you'll have seen this before. But there was a TV show, actually, I'll show you the TV show first. Uh, the TV show was called Alternative Medicine, The Evidence. So I thought, great, I can trust this program. It's, you know, it's called The Evidence. BBC Two is our best TV channel. It's our most respected TV channel. Um, it was made by the Open University, which is, uh, again, a respected academic institution. And it was presented by Cathy Sykes, who is a professor of science communication, and who's done lots of really good things um, in, for science in Britain. So I thought, I'll watch this program. They're gonna, do, they're gonna talk about acupuncture, and I'll find out whether or not it works. And this is the opening of that program. Tomorrow at nine on BBC Two. Truly remarkable stories of the power of alternative medicine now on BBC Two. In a new series, Professor Cathy Sykes examines the evidence. In China, a young woman is having open heart surgery. But it's unlike anything you'll see in the West. She's still conscious. Because instead of a general anaesthetic, this 21st century surgical team are using a 2,000 year old method of controlling pain, acupuncture. Millions of us now believe that this simple needle has extraordinary powers. So I saw that TV show, it was three, four years ago now, and I thought, wow. You know, what the narrator says is, here's a woman in Shanghai having major heart surgery, and instead of general anaesthetic, this 21st century surgical team is using acupuncture. Instead of general anaesthetic, they're using acupuncture. And I thought, this is extraordinary. Um, but I was suspicious, so I started digging around. I started talking to heart specialists, to anaesthetists, to acupuncturists. And I eventually got a report from the Royal College of Anaesthetists. And the Royal College had written a report for the BBC about that very, very footage. So I got hold of this report, and it said, yeah, sure, there was no general anaesthetic. And there was acupuncture. But in addition to the acupuncture, this woman had three of the most powerful sedatives known to mankind, and large volumes of local anaesthetic. In other words, this woman had so many drugs pumping around her body, it didn't matter that she didn't have general anaesthetic, and it didn't matter she had acupuncture, because the drugs were so powerful, this was a, a meaningless demonstration. 
Um, so I submitted a complaint to the BBC, and I love the BBC. I worked for the BBC for seven years, but in this case, I think they got it badly wrong. And the BBC eventually admitted that, that they'd made a mistake. Um, but it got me thinking that two million people would have seen this program, and 50,000 of them, maybe, would have had neck pain, back pain, migraine, and they would have thought, wow, if, if acupuncture can do this, how can it help me? And they would have gone to their local tra Chinese traditional healer. Um, in Britain, every single high street has a Chinese traditional healer on it now. It's incredibly popular. And people would have gone there based on a very, uh, uh, I think, misleading bit of TV footage. So the idea emerged to, to write a book. Um, and this is the English version, and I co-authored it with uh, this chap here, Edzard Ernst. Um, and the idea of the book was to say, look, you can't say all alternative medicine is bad. You can't say it's all good. You have to look at each therapy one by one. And that's what we did. Look, look at each, each therapy one by one and look at the evidence, look at the research, and say, is it safe? Is it dangerous? Does it work? Does it not work? And, and so people really had the best available evidence to make decisions about their own health and their family's health. And I worked with Edzard because he is the world's first professor of complementary medicine. Um, when he was a young man, he, 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 he practiced homeopathy as a doctor. He's from Germany, and in Germany, homeopathy is big. It was invented in Germany. Uh, he practiced herbal medicine. He practiced all sorts of what we would call alternative therapies. But then he became a, a researcher, uh, a rigorous academic researcher in rehabilitative medicine. And he then, when he was about 50, said, right, I'm going to go back to these alternative treatments and test them. Using the research techniques I've, I, I've learned over, over 30 years, I'm going to go back and test homeopathy and, and acupuncture. And that's what he's done for 15 years. So we wrote the book together, we looked at his research, and we looked at research from all over the world to, to, to come to our conclusions. Um, I'll briefly look at um, acupuncture, just because I've started it. Um, the, the way you test there, people say, how do you test alternative medicines? Well, the way you test alternative medicines is the way you, you test any medicine. Um, ideally, you want to conduct a clinical trial. Uh, and, and this was first, this idea, it's, it's kind of developed in different places at different times, but um, one of the, the great breakthroughs was by a Scottish surgeon called James Lind. And uh, if you go back 250 years, the biggest killer was, um, of sailors was not warfare, was not sinking, it was scurvy. Um, sailors who didn't get any vitamin C uh, would th their gums would fall apart, their joints would fall apart, they would disintegrate. And thousands of sailors were dying. Um, and nobody knew what the cause was. And people tried lots of different remedies. But Lynn said, look, what we need to do is conduct a clinical trial. I I'm sure he didn't use those phrases, that word, but he thought we need to test it in a, in a scientific way. And he got 12 sailors and put them into six pairs and one pair, they all had scurvy, same level of scurvy. They were all in the same part of the ship. They were all given the same diet, so good control. And one pair of sailors, though, were given seawater as a remedy. One pair of sailors were given vinegar. One pair of sailors were given uh, cider. One pair of sailors were given sulfuric acid for some odd reason. Um, and one pair were given lemon juice. And the lemon juice sailors recovered within days. And the cider sailors made a small recovery because there's some vitamin C in, in apples. And, and that was it. That's how you work out which therapies work and which don't. Uh, I, you, know, you, you, you take a group of people with a condition and you split them in half. And, and, and typically, with the control, one thing you might want to do um, when you compare them, you know, I, I could give you uh, a treatment and I could give you a fake treatment. Because if, if I give you this new treatment, you will almost inevitably feel better. Not necessarily because of the treatment, but because you're getting some attention. Um, you think the treatment might work. It might change your, your, your mood. It might change your perception of your pain. Um, 
you, you might give reports that are just positive because you want to please the person filling in the form. Um, it could be that with time, your body is healing. So to control for this, we have two groups. One group takes the real medicine, and the other group takes the, the fake medicine. And then you will both have the same uh, benefit due to placebo and so on. But if this treatment really works, then you will have a bigger benefit than this group over here. Okay, so for, simple idea. Now with acupuncture, it's a bit tricky because I can give you all acupuncture, but how do I give you guys fake acupuncture? Um, it's a tricky thing to test. Um, so I need to make you think you're getting acupuncture when you're not getting acupuncture. And there are three ways you can do this. First way is I give you the needles, but I put them in the wrong place. According to Chinese philosophy, the needles need to go in exactly the right place. So I can put the needles in the wrong place, or one, two, three, yeah, or I can put them into the wrong depth, just a millimeter. This group, it would go in four, five, six millimeters. For this group, it would be superficial. Or the best technique is to use needles that are like telescopes. So you get real needles, but with this group, I put the needle into the skin, but as it goes into the skin, the needle goes back up into the handle. And you feel the pressure, you see the needle go in, but your skin isn't even being punctured. And so you can do different ways of controlling. So you can test acupuncture. Uh, there have been lots and lots of trials. I won't go into this in any detail. Um, but this is a, a, publish, a paper that was published a year or so ago. And it's a review of 13 trials with 3,000 patients. And, and this is what the, the data looks like. Um, so on the left-hand side, if the data point is on the left-hand, e sorry, each of these points represents one trial. Um, and this trial shows that real acupuncture is better than fake acupuncture because the line is on this side, the dot is on this line, but the error bar touches zero. So this isn't really a significant result. The second one shows that real acupuncture is even more effective, but again, the error bar is very large. This one shows that fake acupuncture is better than real acupuncture. But again, the error bars are not significant. When you take all of the data together, and do what's called a meta-analysis, you get this data point here. So this data point suggests that real acupuncture seems to be marginally, marginally more effective than fake acupuncture. It's marginal. Um, there are different ways to explain this. I mean, uh, acupuncturists would say this, this is evidence that shows that their therapy works. For me, I would say, well, I can't dismiss acupuncture, I can't say it's all rubbish, but this is not a convincing result. The conclusion of this study was uh, a small analgesic effect of acupuncture was found, which seems to lack clinical relevance and cannot be clearly distinguished from bias. Whether needling uh, at points or specific sites reduces pain independently of psychological impact of the treatment ritual is unclear. So with 13 trials, with 3,000 patients, the evidence is still really, really very, very poor at best. Um, uh, and, and we're just looking for acupuncture here in terms of pain. When we look at acupuncture in terms of, uh, of, of addiction or obesity or diabetes or anything else, so you, you see these crazy claims, um, the evidence, I think, really is non-existent. Uh, the positive evidence is non-existent. But for pain, it's very weak as well. I, that's the way I would interpret it. Um, so that's what the book was about, that's what we were trying to do, and then um, w when you write a book, when you publish a book, you want to give talks, you want to give uh, lectures and interviews, and you write articles to promote the book, to let people know the book exists. And so when the book was published two, almost, no, two and a half years ago, that's what Edzard and I did. We gave talks and lectures and interviews and wrote articles. And these are the main sections in the book, acupuncture, herbal medicine, homeopathy, and chiropractic. That was the fourth big treatment that we looked at. We looked at all the others as well, but, but these were the four big ones. And uh, so I wrote an article about chiropractic. And uh, I wrote it for the Guardian newspaper two and a half years ago. And I pointed out some very simple things. 
First of all, what is chiropractic? Uh, I think chiropractic is fairly big in, 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 uh, in Norway. It, uh, hands up if you've been to a chiropractor. Wow. Gosh, so that's about, I, I would say it's about a quarter of the people here. May, maybe a fifth. It's, it's, it's substantial. And um, I suspect that probably means it may be a quarter of you either know people or have family that have been to a chiropractor. So in America, chiropractors are huge. In Britain, they're pretty big. And in Norway, they're pretty big as well. And so I said, what, what do chiropractors do? Well, they manipulate your spine. That's what a chiropractor does. If you go and see a reflexologist, they'll look at your feet. If you see an iridologist, they'll look at your eye. If you go to a chiropractor, they will look at your spine. And what do they treat? Um, so hands up again, who went to see a chiropractor but not for a back problem? Okay, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I think there were about 35 people before put their hand up. Now it's less than five. So most people who go to a chiropractor go for a back problem because that's spinal manipulation. If you've got lower back pain or you've got neck ache, maybe spinal manipulation will help you. And there's some evidence that, that chiropractors can help. I think the evidence is weak, but everybody struggles to treat back problems. So if you had a back problem, you could go and see a chiropractor. There are some risks, so you, you need to think twice. Um, there's a very common risk of temporary pain and stiffness and, and bruising. So, you know, those are minor problems um, and something you may be willing to, to accept if you have back pain. But I would never let a chiropractor go near the top of your neck because there's one technique they have where they, they jerk the head like that. Um, uh, and and it, it's quite a common technique that's used, this jerking of, of the top of the neck. And that can damage the arteries that go to the brain and that can lead to stroke. Um, there are several hundred documented cases of people suffering severe trauma as a result of going to a chiropractor. It's still very, very rare, and I wouldn't necessarily discourage you from going to a chiropractor, but I would discourage you from letting them touch the top of your neck. So what is chiropractic? It's spinal manipulation. What do they do? They treat back problems, and um, there are some risks. Um, but what else do they treat? Well, it turns out they treat quite a few other things. In particular, in Britain, half of the chiropractors in Britain treat these conditions. Ear infections, asthma, and colic, particularly in children. Well, you know, colic and ear infections are solely children. So this is very odd. So, and I said to him in the article, I said, why on earth is spinal manipulation being performed on children to, to cure asthma or ear infections? I don't see the evidence to justify the treatment and I don't think parents should take their children to see a chiropractor. Now, before I go on to what happened next, you might think, well, why on earth would a chiropractor believe this? Well, if you go to the history of chiropractic, this is a chap called uh, Daniel Day Palmer. No, not Daniel Day Palmer. That was Daniel Day Lewis. That's somebody else. Daniel Palmer. Um, I don't know. Um, Daniel Palmer, he, he invented chiropractic uh, about 100 years ago. And he was a sort of a spiritual healer, magnetic healer. Um, before really the advent of proper medical science, and, and he invented chiropractic. And the first two people he treated did not have back problems. The first two people he treated, one was profoundly deaf, and one had heart condition. And by manipulating the spine, he cured the deafness. By manipulating the spine, he cured the heart condition. And he, he, you know, for him, he wasn't treating the back by manipulating the back, he was treating the whole body by manipulating the back. Because his philosophy was that the spine carries the nervous system through to the rest of the body. And he'd called, uh, he said that the nervous system carries something called innate energy. And if the nervous system is blocked in the spine, then the innate energy won't get to the rest of the body. And that's why you get sick. So if you have a problem, it's because innate energy is blocked. Manipulate the spine, you can allow the innate energy to flow. It sounds a bit like chi. The meridians carry the, the vital force. If the vital force is blocked, you need to unblock it. Acupuncturists do it with, with needles. Uh, Day thought he could do it. Uh, Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know where this um, Palmer thought he could do it with spinal manipulation. And so, you know, chiropractic, as I say, was not about treating the back, it was treating about the whole, it was about treating the whole body. And if you look at the adverts, um, the cause of disease, uh, chiropractic adjusts the cause of disease. Uh, if you are afflicted in any way, look up the chiropractor. Um, there are very few diseases, as they are understood today, which are not treatable by the chiropractic method. So chiropractors really believe they could do anything. And uh, even today, you find uh, adverts uh, like this. Uh, this is a website, you know, if you have a problem with your bladder, you manipulate the spine here. This is a blog I saw recently, probably last year now. Um, chiropractic, your best defense against swine flu and influenza. That by manipulating the spine, you can boost the immunity of the body. A, a crazy, crazy uh, belief systems, in my opinion. Um, so, when you think about all of this, it's not so surprising that half of the chiropractors in the UK believe in this. Most, I would say half the chiropractors just deal with the back. The other half deal with the back, plus they do children's conditions. And a very small minority have really, really wide ambitions. But this is what I wrote about, and this is what I was concerned about two and a half years ago. And I wrote an article, I published it, and about a month after the article was published, I was threatened with libel by the British Chiropractic Association. Um, they sent me a letter, they said, we, you know, we disagree with what you've said. Uh, I mentioned the British Chiropractic Association in the article. And they said, you are, you are, you are criticizing us and ruining our reputation. And if you don't apologize, we're going to sue you for libel. Uh, now, this battle went on for two years, but I'll go through it very quickly. Um, the article was published in 2008. The threat of libel came in 2008, just a month later. They were suing me personally. Um, not the Guardian newspaper. In libel, you can sue the publisher, you can sue the distributor, you can sue the writer. So if you're a blogger, you could be sued as the blogger, but your web host could also be sued as the publisher. Okay, so there are lots of different people you can sue, and in this case, the BCA, the British Chiropractic Association, tried to sue me personally, not the Guardian. Um, nevertheless, I went to the Guardian, and I said, look, you know, I'm being sued for libel. Um, you know, wh what are we going to do? And they said, not so quick with the we. Uh, <laughs> and um, they, 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 um, they said, look, it's, well, initially they were very helpful. I, sh I should say the Guardian worked, worked very hard to start with. Uh, and when you, when you looked at their eyes, they were terrified. They were really, really scared because even though I was being sued personally because I had a contract with the Guardian, they did have some responsibility. But, but they were really terrified because libel in England, one, it's ridiculously expensive, and I'll come back to that later. And secondly, as the writer, you nearly always lose. Okay, The writer is in a very, very difficult position. Uh, it's not a level playing field. Uh, the, the, the claimant has all the advantages in English libel. And so the Guardian was scared. And the Guardian tried to do anything to get out of the problem. They said, um, let, let's give the BCA a right of reply. Let's give them 400 words. Simon says they don't have any evidence to back up these claims. Let them put their evidence down. The BCA said, no, we don't want to put our evidence down. We want Simon to apologize. So the Guardian said, fine, look, we'll apologize. And the BCA said, no, we don't want the Guardian to apologize. We want Simon to apologize. And I can't apologize for something which I think is correct. And at that point, the Guardian said, look, Simon, you're the kind of the problem. You know, if you don't apologize, if you apologize, the whole thing goes away. But if you're not prepared to apologize, then you're on your own. So at that point, um, I, I was going to have to defend the case on my own. So I then went to see a lawyer, I went to see another lawyer, a chap called Robert Dugans, worked for a law firm called Brian Cave, um, a blogger called Jack of Kent, David Allen Green, who some of you may follow, um, put me in touch with Robert Dugans, and uh, I went to see Robert Dugans, and I said, look, Robert, this is what I wrote, this is why I wrote it, this is the evidence, do you think I can win? And he said, yeah, I think you've got a 60% chance of winning. English libel is really tough, but you should win. 
And I said, great, let's fight. Let's you know, send them a letter back and tell them that we're not going to apologize. He said, no. He said, just apologize. Just, you know, just, just let it go. Because in England, again, because it's so expensive, even if you win, you will end up losing. Um, ben Goldacre, some of you may read, I'm sure some of you read Ben Goldacre's column and books. Uh, he was sued for libel, also writing in The Guardian. Um, he criticized a, a vitamin salesman called Matthias Rath. And Matthias Rath was selling vitamins in South Africa to treat HIV and AIDS. And Ben Goldacre said, look, this is just, this is uh, absurd. And Rath sued Ben Goldacre and The Guardian. To defend the case, now, now eventually, I think after about a year and a half, um, Rath dropped the case. He, he, even he realized that he, he couldn't win this one. So he dropped the case. But the Guardian had to spend half a million pounds in order to defend themselves. Um, and when you, loot, when you win, you can get the money back from the other side. But you never get all of your money back. And so the Guardian today are still £175,000 out of pocket for winning a case. So the next time that somebody goes to the Guardian and says, right, I want to, I want to criticize this alternative therapist, the Guardian are going to say, well, we'd like to publish it, but the last time we did it, it cost us £175,000, and we were right. So the pressure on the newspapers is really scary. Um, and that, but I said to Brian Cave, I said, look, you know, if it's crazy for me to defend the article, then it's crazy for them to continue suing me. So if I defend the article, then surely they will back down before I back down. And I was wrong. Um, uh, so the case went on. It went on, I, I went on for two and a half years. No, two years it went on for. Um, and eventually, when it looked very bad at some time, sometimes it looked like I was going to lose, and at other times it started looking a bit better. And eventually, we got some preliminary rulings from, from judges in, the, in, in London who really began to favor my position. And they began to favor my position so strongly that uh, the BCA dropped the case. Um, but it, was, it took two years. It was very expensive. It was very stressful and annoying. Uh, but um, some good things came out of it. And I'll finish with the three good things that came out of it. I'll try and race through these very, very quickly, because it'd be good to have time for questions. Um, first good thing that came out of it uh, was I became a father um, just, just after the case ended. Um, so at the Court of Appeal, my little baby was uh, in my wife's tummy watching the Court of Appeal. Uh, my wife and I argue about whether uh, the baby looks more like me or looks more like her. Um, I think Harry looks more like me. I'll let you judge. Here he is. See, I think he's suspecting it was me. I don't know what it is. Um, second positive thing that came out of it was people started talking about chiropractic. Um, magazines, newspapers, scientific journals started talking about chiropractic and said, you know, who are these people? What, 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 are, they, what are their claims? What's their evidence? And the BMA, the British, sorry, no, the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, wrote a piece where they had two articles, one by Edzard Ernst, my co-author, criticizing the evidence, and one by the uh, BCA president putting forward the evidence. And the BMJ conclusion was this. Um, Readers can decide for themselves whether or not they are convinced. Edzard is not. His demolition of the 18 references is, to my mind, complete. So here we have the BMJ talking about chiropractic and telling all of the doctors in Britain that they're not convinced by the evidence. So that, that's great. You know, that's, that's what we need. We need people looking at the evidence, scrutinizing it, and telling healthcare professionals and the public what the truth is. Second good thing that came out of it, um, was something connected with skeptics. Um, skeptics started looking at the evidence and started saying, look, this doesn't make sense. You know, these claims really are not sensible. You know, what Simon has said sort of makes sense, but what the chiropractors are saying is ridiculous. And a couple of bloggers, just two, three bloggers, um, Maria, uh, Maria McLachlan uh, and Alan, Alan Hennis and Simon Perry, the three of them started to look at chiropractic websites. And they would look for words like colic and asthma and ear infections. And they knew the evidence wasn't there. And 
they started submitting complaints to the General Chiropractic Council, which is the government body which should oversee what chiropractors do. Now, the General Chiropractic Council used to get 20 complaints a year. In one month, because of these three bloggers, in one month they received 600 complaints. Uh, and right now, those 600 complaints are being examined one by one. And in the meantime, all the chiropractors have pretty much taken down all of their claims in relation to children because they realize that they themselves can't back up their claims. So this is incredibly powerful and it shows what just two or three people can do by, by, by submitting complaints, by using the regulations, um, they can overhaul an entire medical system and uh, it's extraordinary what's happened here. The third good thing that's come out of it is a campaign for reforming English libel. Um, English libel is horrendously unfair. I've said it before that if you're a writer, you're almost destined to lose. As a writer, it's so expensive that you can't even afford to defend yourself. Um, and that means writer in terms of academic writers, scientists, academic journals, bloggers, authors, everybody is completely, um, uh, you know, the odds are stacked against them if they get sued for libel. And the, the problem, it's an English problem because it's an English law, but it's a problem that affects you as well, and it affects everybody here because because of the internet and because of, of the fact that, that books can be sold all over the world and because books are translated all over the world, if you publish something here in Norway, you can get sued in England for libel. It's called libel tourism. In fact, people all over the world, if they want to sue someone, they will sue them in London. London is the libel capital of the world. And they will sue them in London, not because English law is so good, but because English law is so bad. Um, I'll go through some of these cases. Um, um, well, uh, uh, let me, th 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 there's a case here in Norway. I, I just saw this on the net last night. Um, I don't know Christina. But I just saw she, she blogged about this, uh, well, I think it's your biggest Norwegian business newspaper, uh, was sued. And it was sued uh, by this financial securities company, and they were sued in London. So this is a, day, a Norwegian newspaper being sued by a Norwegian company in London. Now, why on earth can, can they sue in London? Well, the Norwegian company will say that this is a newspaper, it's on the web, there will be Norwegians in London who will read this newspaper, so therefore the material is read in London. And this is a big company, and this big company, because it's a financial company, will work with clients in London. So it has a reputation in London. If you have a reputation in London, if something is read in London, you're in trouble. Um, and, and this is the problem you face. There's, there's a very famous example of uh, a, an American author called Rachel Ehrenfeld, who wrote an article about a Saudi billionaire, who wrote a book about a Saudi, she wrote a book about the funding of terrorism, which mentioned a Saudi billionaire. But the Saudi billionaire sued the American author, American publisher, in London. And again, it's the same thing. He can say, I'm a billionaire. I, I'm a billionaire, I have property, I have businesses, I, I, I have a reputation in London. And her book, because of Amazon, was sold in London. She sold a huge number of copies in London. She sold 23 copies in London. <laughs> but the whole book had to be scrapped, and, and that was it. And, and uh, there's a Dan I was looking for sort of thinking of Scandinavian examples. There's a Danish uh, radiographer, Henrik Thompson, who gave a talk in Oxford about the safety of an imaging agent used in medical imaging. And he was sued by American healthcare company, GE Healthcare, in London. Uh, there's a, a Swedish uh, linguistics professor, Professor Francisco Lacerda, wrote an article about an Israeli technology company, and they sued the journal in London. So I, I'm, I'm very proud of England in many ways, um, but I'm very ashamed of our libel laws. Um, and we, we're trying to change them. And, and because of my case and because of other cases, and because of Ben Goldacre's case, there's been a real campaign in, in, in Britain to try and change the laws. Um, a huge number of people signing up. We now have 50,000 people signed up to the campaign. Um, the, uh, you know, a, a, a huge range of people. Um, even little Harry doesn't get away with it. Here he is. 
keep libel laws out of science. Uh, we join everybody into the cause. Um, uh, but, but the support amongst bloggers and skeptics has been enormous. I was in Tam Vegas not long ago, and the number of American skeptics that signed up to this and supported us is enormous. Um, in Australia, I know Cosmos magazine started writing articles about libel in England and getting Australians to sign up. So I'd really encourage you, if you want to help change English libel laws, please do sign up. If you've already signed up, I know some of you have already signed up, then please encourage your friends to sign up because there's a real chance that we can change the libel law in England. Um, the government at the moment is redrafting a new libel bill, which will be published in February. And they're doing that just because of the pressure from scientists and skeptics and human rights groups and so on. But it's all emerged in the last year. So um, thank you very much for those people that have signed. Thanks to the skeptical community in general for sort of backing the campaign. And uh, fingers crossed, um, by the time you have your next big meeting here in Norway, um, somebody will be here from England being, being able to tell you that we have indeed changed our libel laws. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.